Uh, I totally forgot to press the button. So sorry for people who are not here. Uh, I forgot to press the start button. So you missed uh, the first uh, 45 minutes of the lecture. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry for that. It was not intentional. All right, so um, the question was, um, so please, uh, please talk with those, the other people uh, who were in the class. What I covered is I talked a little bit about what is kind of expected for assignment two, and I focused on those, on the data types of, of the type system, uh, the sum and product types. And the, the reason why we covered all those material areas such that you can kind of use it for the assignment two. You, you should pay attention to how you define and how you use functions um, and how you define and how you use the different type, type systems. Um, if you want, you can go a little bit more deeper into a better encapsulating mechanisms and use functors and applicatives. And if you kind of really good, you can try to, to play with the, with the monads and with, especially with the state monad, which will make some of your kind of uh, encapsulations and compositions much nicer, uh, but you don't have to. I mean, you can implement um, the basics with the normal type system and with the normal functions. Then we covered a little bit what you start with. You start with uh, processing the literals and the numbers, bool, strings, lists, and quotations. You, you need to do that first. Uh, and then you can uh, start implementing functions for them. Um, and then uh, there was a, a question from Sindra of examples of some types. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the, the most famous example of a some type is maybe, right? So maybe is a some type. And it's defined as um, so. It is defined as um, just a right. So it is a type class which is parameterized by a concrete type, um, and then it is de um, defined like this, right? So. Um, uh, a maybe is defined as just something, for example, just string or just int or integer or you know whatever type concrete type you have here, uh, or nothing, right? Um, and a similar um, but a little bit more powerful um, uh, some type is uh, uh, either, right? So either and either has two parameters, two, two concrete types, um, which has kind of the left one and the right one. So you can uh, have like maybe is parameterized by just a single type, and then it's either the value of the type or nothing, and either is parameterized by two type concrete types. And then one kind of goes on the left hand side, and the other one goes on the right hand side, such that you can have, for example, when you're processing numbers and you want to keep adding numbers and doing something with numbers, you will kind of say, okay, I will kind of instantiate, um, I will have uh, my type um, that has either being kind of an int, um, like you, you need two, right? So if you want to deal with um, numbers, let's say you 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 have kind of a int on the right hand side, and here you need to say what you want as an error. Sometimes you want a concrete type of an error. Sometimes you are fine with kind of dealing with strings, and then you can kind of uh, you you know uh, it doesn't matter whether you're doing left or right hand side, but in Haskell uh, it's kind of uh, the default pattern that you're doing uh, right hand side for the um, positive things for things that kind of uh, continue, like when you're composing the applicatives. And then when things blow up, you kind of fall back to the left hand side, right? Um, yeah, so that's that's great. Yeah, so th those are kind of uh, uh, some types um, because they are um, like, you know, you can call them some types, you can call them uh, uh, enums, like in Rust, they are called enums. Uh, and what like why do why they are called some types is because 
like if I say, um, so um, how many possible things a uh, bull has? Well, bull has possibly two things, right? It's either true or false, right? So uh, a bull is a sum type, which is either true, it has a true literal or false, and that kind of defines like the domain uh, and the, the items in that domain is the, the sum of all those options that you have. And because here you have just two options, then you basically have a value of, of two, right? Uh, so we, we sum that up. So now if I have a maybe bool, uh, then what happens is, well, I can have just bool, right? Or nothing. So then I have, um, here I have two options and then I have one extra option. So then like my maybe bool has three possible outcomes, three possible things it can have. It can be just true, just false or nothing, right? So it's three. Um, if you define kind of a, a, a struct type, right? So if you have some, um, like if you have, um, that would not be maybe bool, it's something else like a um, different type. And then if you say, I have, um, I have something like, um, I don't know, some proposition, which is of type bool, and I have um, something else. Yeah, so let's say I have a, some prefix, which is also of type bool. Then like this one has two options, and this one has two options, and together they are kind of a product type because all together I can have four possible outcomes. I can have, you know, uh, false, 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 true, uh, true, false, or true, true, right? So I have four possible outcomes. So you kind of multiply this with this, uh, with, with the sum types, you kind of sum how many things you have, right? Uh, so that, that's how we use the term. All right, uh, questions. Based on the explanations I've done, um, is it easier? Is it kind of uh, more clear what is expected? Sounds good from the class, use the chat or, or speak up. I don't know if I actually can. Uh, Yeah, but you will probably write, you will probably not speak. I, I'm not sure if I have my, my speakers up. <laughs> so if, if someone speaks, if I will hear it. Um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, so this is a bit clearer. Uh, I hope it is clearer and I hope um, you kind of understand that it's not really about abstract syntax trees or parsing or, or things like that. I mean, you do need to know a little bit and that's why I kind of recorded the lecture to talk a little bit about abstract syntax trees and how you do parsing and so on. But, you know, effectively here you, you, you have a program and your program is just a list of words that you've tokenized from the, from the input if you're using white separated um, default implementation, right? Um, if you just use the, the tokens as strings, because words gives you strings, right? Uh, that's not that useful because you want to distinguish, like for example, you don't want, uh, like if, if the program consists of true like this, uh, and the words gives you like a string of true, you need to kind of uh, turn it into true. You want to turn it into bool, right? Same with a number, like if, if the, um, program consists of number 20, you don't want a string of 20, you want a number 20, right? And the same if the program consists of a, of a number 20.5 or 0.2, you want a float, right? Um, and you want to represent them into some, as something, right? Um, because you want to have this value in a context of what it is, such that later you can kind of uh, do some interpretations, right? So for example, on top of the stack, you will have two values, and then if I'm doing end and the values are not bool, then you can just blow up. Or if they are 
let's say numbers, you can decide what you do. Like you can do like JavaScript that uh, zero is false and anything different than zero is true and then end would work for numbers. But if it doesn't make sense, then you just blow up. Um, so then, so, so you have kind of a program, you have this kind of very minimalistic parsing uh, because also like, for example, for print, you want to detect that print is a function that you know about, right? Same with end. You want to detect that it's a function that you know about plus and so on. So there is a number of, of symbols that you know about. And then for everything else you say, I don't know what it is or you treat it as a variable name, right? So if I, if I say foo and foo is a not known function, then foo must be a variable name because um, what else could that be, right? Uh, and then if I uh, write a variable name, what does it mean? Do I know about this variable? Did I have a program which said like, if I do this 10 foo, we use this one for assignment I, if I remember correctly, then you will know that foo is actually bound to 10, right? Um, that it, it is kind of assigned a value of 10. But if I didn't have it, uh, like I didn't have it yet. So I'm interpreting, okay? So it's like, okay, put 10 on top of the stack and then foo. What is foo? Well, I don't know, it's a variable name, right? So put a variable name on the stack, right? So now I have 10 and I have a variable name uh, foo on the stack, right? So, so this is my stack. I have a int number on top of the stack and I have a variable name on top of the stack. And then I have the assignment, right? I have this uh, thing that I need to interpret. And then this thing takes two items of the stack. It expects a variable name and it expects something, some value that this will become, right? So that's, that's what happens with this, with, this line of, um, with this line of code. Um, so, and then, yeah, then, that, then the complexity kind of uh, rolls, right? Don't, don't jump into the big complexity. Start with the, with the simple things first. And then once you have this kind of the, the primitive parsing done, then you, you need to interpret, okay, what do I do if I get a minus function? What do I do if I get a plus function? And so on, you do the simple ones. Uh, and uh, not th all those are simple ones. Okay, then you get into quotations. What do I do if I get a quotation? Uh, so the, the simplest way to start with quotation is exec, right? Because exec expects a quotation on the stack. And then what exec do, does is it takes this quotation off the stack and runs it, right? Uh, so that's the, the simplest kind of a program manipulation instruction that you will use. So for example, if I have 10, 20 of, on the stack, and then I have a quotation and my, okay, let's write it in one line. And the quotation is plus, okay? And then I have exec. Okay, then, okay, 10 goes on top of the stack, 20 goes on top of the stack, whoops. Then I have my quotation on top of the stack. And then I have to interpret exec. Do I put exec on top of the stack? No, 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 exec is a function that I need to do something with, right? So what exec does? Well, exec picks that top thing from the stack and runs it on what on top of what the stack currently is. So my exec will consume this and will run the plus on the current stack. So it and what plus does? Well, it consumes two numbers from the top of the stack and puts the sum on top. So then this program will kind of result in this. Um, as I was explaining to you, there is no line numbers or line endings, so you can rewrite the whole program like this, and it is exactly the same program. The white space between the space and the end of line makes no difference. So this is exactly the same program, and that's what you expect out of it, right? So do that. Um, do kind of a step by step. Do some small things such that you kind of get confident with using your data structures and getting what smells, right? Like if you have your implementation and you, you got to this point and your code smells, like you have to do a lot of coding and a lot of things and you're not happy with it. Don't go into each and map yet, right? So each and map are kind of the um, and more complex things uh, which operate on lists. Um, and if, if this already smells, then this will smell a lot, right? So fix that first. Um, I will, uh, you know, I will be more happy with you doing that nicely 
or you're doing all three in a very smelly way, right? That would be less valuable than you doing one thing that you've kind of uh, done nice, okay? Um, uh, before you jump into each and map, you probably should do if, right? So um, do the very simple functions first, then try to deal like with exec uh, because that's necessary uh, for if, right? I, I can tell you a secret. Uh, so for example, for um, my secret for implementing if and each is that I rewrite the program using exec. I actually don't interpret them yet. I just reorganize my program in such a way that I rewrite it, that it basically looks as if there are quotations and exec, right? And then I start interpreting it, okay? And that makes my implementation kind of nice and I can kind of deal with uh, uh, recursive exec, inside exec, and, and, and so on. Because I basically just keep kind of uh, rewriting my program. You can do it differently, right? I'm not saying my solutions are the best or the nicest. In fact, I'm hoping they are not. And I'm hoping you will kind of come up with a better way of, um, of organizing it. And like, not all of you, but some really like A students, you, you might be better than I am in Haskell by now, okay? Uh, and I would not be surprised that you come up, came up with a, a nicer pattern. Um, or you found a nicer pattern in Stack Overflow, right? I, I implemented everything from head, from my head. I, I didn't uh, look into Stack Overflow for anything. I used uh, my head and my um, and the textbook. Uh, but you can potentially find out a, a nicer way. But I didn't, and I kind of uh, re-implemented if and each using exec. So I rewrite internally uh, if and each statements into statements which don't have if and each, but they only have exec and quotations. Uh, and then I sort of interpret it because I do have a native implementation for this, for exec, right? Um, what else? Um, yeah, other questions? You ask me questions. Yeah, the, the goal is not you implement everything. You, the goal is you master those, um, you master this, right? You get confident, you get comfortable with recursion, with functions, with partially applied functions, with um, composition, like how you, because the, you know, you, to interpret the whole program, you have to keep applying something on top of what is kind of being your stack. Right, you, you do need to kind of maintain some form of state. You can kind of maintain it by having pure functions which take a stack and return a stack, and you compose your functions by like, you know, um, calling yourself with, with uh, things that kind of get returned, but that gets a little bit tedious. Uh, it's a fine, I mean, you can, you can do it this way, but if you can uh, use an applicative, or if you can use a state monad, then you can kind of maintain the state and you don't need to pass it around all the time. You, it kind of is in an in, in, uh, argument of your function, right? And then you don't need to kind of keep passing it. It's sort of, you are working within the context of that, of that stack or of that state. And then your functions are kind of a, a little bit cleaner but they basically do the same thing. So if you didn't use a state monad, then as I said, you, you don't need to. Um, getting comfortable with recursion, getting comfortable with some types, uh, with either and maybe, where to use maybe, where to use either. I implemented initially my all my error handling with maybe, and I, just blow, I was just blowing up. I didn't have any context of what blowed up. I just said, okay, that couldn't be done. You know, I got nothing and then there was an error. Uh, I rewrote it later with either uh, to have kind of a, a, a better context. And then initially I used string, but then instead of using a string, I really wanted to have a little bit more context because I wanted to deal with these exceptional situations. So I turned it up into a, 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 another some type, which I could uh, check what will kind of, what was the cause of the left-hand side. If I have the right hand side, you know, things keep rolling, my program keeps uh, computing. But if I jump to the left hand side, I wanted to see 
what was the reason? Was that an error or was that just an exception and like IO exception that I need to deal with IO and kind of continue with my program? So then to do that, I had to keep, keep state of my program or of my stack. You will notice that with, uh, with some of the, um, potentially with some of the program control implementations that you may need to keep track of where you are on, uh, you know, with the stack. Yeah, anyway, um, as I'm saying, like I can help you with all, with, with this, with this, and this is the main point, this, this is the main point. If you have any questions of any of that, those are good questions. Uh, and I will be happy to explain. If you ask me about the BPROC, most of the things in BPROC boils down to those questions or to your choice. And the choice is yours. I don't want to tell you what to do. Like, um, it's kind of up to you. Like, how, how hard you want to dial the complexity. You can start very simple. You can start like, don't use any fancy things. Use maybe and use just functions and start with the um, simple functions and do that. And that's, that's fine. That's great. Uh, and that's easy. I mean, that, that is easy. Um, if you want to get a little bit more fancy, yeah, try applicatives and try more fancy some types and do the same, but in a more fancy way. If you get confi comfortable, confident with that, then try to do a little bit more fancy functions, like uh, start with exec, uh, and then think, okay, I, if, I, if you already have an exec, what can you benefit from having an exec, for example, for if? I mean, you know, if has two quotations and you need to run one of them, right? So maybe, yeah, maybe if you hit true or false, you just rewrite this uh, based on the, on the state of the stack, right? Um, and that's, that's your implementation for if. Um, piggybacking on the implementation of exec, right? So don't repeat yourself. That's one of the rules such that if I have to copy and paste my code from exec to if, maybe I don't need to do that. Maybe I can kind of uh, piggyback of my existing implementation. Once you did exec and if, okay, try each uh, or times. Th those are kind of the, uh, the looping ones which are easier than loop, uh, do those. If you've done them and you're confident and your code doesn't smell, great. Uh, try, uh, try map and loop. If you've done all of that and you have uh, and you're happy with it, then do print and read, right? Print and read, as I'm saying, they, they were like for me, they were the hardest to uh, do in a pure way because I actually need to reinvent like a monad in like uh, inside BeepRock such that I can kind of uh, have that in a separate context. Uh, there, are, there is a cheap, a cheap way of doing them. If you basically wrap everything in I.O., then you can do print and read really trivially, but then your code is dirty. Your code is not pure anymore, right? And don't sacrifice that. Don't, don't implement print and read just to have print and read and sacrifice the purity. I prefer you having everything in a pure way and not have print and read at all uh, if you can't do it. But don't pollute your, your implementation with I.O. Uh, because then you cannot test it. You cannot have tests. All right. Um, if there are no questions, then uh, please let me know. Um, so there, there is a question is print and read required for A? Yes. So if you want to get A, you should do print and and. and print and read, but if you do print and read in a dirty way such that everything else is dirty, then you will not get A neither. You, you will get B maybe. So having said that, there is no grade for assignment two, right? As I'm saying, there is a grade for your portfolio. So you may have implementation for assignment two without print and you may get A anyway. Uh, for the portfolio because you've done an excellent job with uh, assignment one and we have some extra work and with some peer review and then uh, your way of thinking suggests you should get A. So, so yes, so um, is print and read required to get A for the portfolio? No, it's not. But it, 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 surely it will help if you, if you do that, but it's not required, yeah. All 
All right, so uh, what you guys decided for the uh, for the way forward with the uh, with the course uh, workload and for the course um, grading, uh, we don't have a lot of time. But like, did did you decide it uh, as a group or you didn't decide it? Yeah, I mean that's fine with me. Uh, if you want to go with the default, then uh, that's fine with me. Um, I I am happy with a, an, some you know any alternative. Uh, I would like like okay, wh why do we have the project with the zero MQ? What is zero MQ giving us on top of those things that we have here? Um, so on top of the like the course is really about this okay Th this is what the course so far was about and this is what assignment two is about and this is what is the 80 percent of the course okay there is a little bit of extra uh so the little bit of extra is rust uh i you know i don't expect you to be fluent in rust i mean that's impossible but i kind of expect you to do some small things in rust i do expect you to be able to fight the owner checker and uh, you know be able to do some things like you know a little bit more than hello world um so rust is kind of a, a, like you know um entry level rust ability uh we did have it in the course uh we covered a couple of topics so um you kind of showcasing in your portfolio some rust would kind of benefit you because we did spend you know a couple of weeks on on rust and you should you should demonstrate it um there is one element which is um which we haven't dealt a lot with but it's the ability to um organize your system in such a way that you can have two uh independent implementations you do that in the in the cloud course and in the cloud course you, you use rest apis right so you use rest and um http protocol and json uh for passing data around right um and decomposing your kind of more complex problem into smaller implementations which talk to each other okay and then so so that's in the cloud uh and you're quite you know familiar with it you know by the end of the cloud course uh and here we have an alternative which is almost identical uh like rest api but it it has kind of a, a very lightweight um lightweight efficient uh transport okay a transport that you don't deal with that you don't deal with right based on a kind of an abstract notion of a socket right and that abstraction allows you to talk uh between different modules in the same way as um rest api helps you but you know for rest api you do need to have an http http server right uh here it's kind of a lightweight you don't need to have that um so those okay so th this is cloud so that's not us but that's um those are two additional elements which i would like you to have in a portfolio uh, on top of this right um so the project is like okay do something anything that demonstrates that you can do a little bit of rust and you can do a little bit of this um, this using of those sockets. Um, you can do projects just in Rust. Like I, I already know your Haskell because most of you used Haskell for assignment two. So you may not need to use Haskell, but um, I want to make the, the project kind of uh, very simple, but touching on those two aspects, right? Okay, I, I think we have to stop. Uh, we have the, let me see. We have a meeting with the, yeah, with the AI course. No, I have a meeting with AI course. I don't know if the whole class needs to go there. So I have to go. Uh, we have a discussion on the um, AI course now. So I will close now. And um, again, apologies for not recording from the from the beginning. <laughs>